good news and bad news today for the residents of Mayflower, Arkansas. All right, the good news is that Exxon announced they're developing an official plan to evacuate an oil pipeline that ruptured underneath a Mayflower subdivision on Friday. The bad news is that this, this is how residents of that subdivision spent their Easter weekend. So that is a pipeline that is busted and is flooded the neighborhood and is going all the way to the drain at the end of the street. Um, luckily, our house is here, which is seemingly unaffected, but the smell is unbelievable. I mean, look. Incredible. And that is oil. That is oil. More precisely, that is heavy crude oil from the tar sands of Canada spewing out onto the lawns and sidewalks and the streets and past the basketball hoops of the Northwoods subdivision. That video was shot by Drew Barnes, a homeowner from the area. Hat tip. The 20-inch Exxon mobile pipeline carrying the crude, which was installed in the late 1940s, burst on Friday. Almost in two dozen homes in the area have been evacuated while the cleanup gets underway. The EPA has classified it as a major spill. ExxonMobil has not yet said how much oil is estimated to have spilled, only that as of this evening, they cleaned up 12,000 barrels of oil and water. In local news coverage of the spill, it was common to hear evacuated residents say they did not even know they lived essentially on top of a 60-year-old oil pipeline. And of course, in the cable news business, the true measure of any oil spill is a degree of heartbreak spread by images of its avian victims. These obligatory photos of oil-covered fowl come from the Hawk Center in Arkansas. Most of these birds had been bathed at least once before these pictures were taken. Just two days before the big suburban spill in Arkansas, a train derailed in western Minnesota, spilling 15,000 gallons of crude into a rural Minnesota field. We don't know for sure whether that was also tar sands oil, but we do know that it came from Alberta, which at this point is probably as famous for its tar sands as for anything else. As for the pipeline that ruptured in Arkansas, that pipeline used to carry crude oil from Texas up to north, up north to Illinois. But in 2006, because there was so much heavy crude oil coming out of Canada, Exxon reversed it. So now it flows north to south, bringing dirtier, harder to clean up crude oil through the middle of the country. As America is projected to become the Western Hemisphere's hub for fossil fuel extraction, with some oil analysts even predicting that we'll surpass Saudi Arabia in oil output by 2020, we have a new dystopic vision of what our future life among our own fossil fuels might look like. This could be your subdivision soon, unless we do something differently. The amount of fossil fuel extraction we're doing now and the amount we're set to do, particularly if the 1,200-mile Keystone XL pipeline is ultimately approved, means that whether it's fracking in your backyard or a pipeline that's going to run underneath your subdivision, this is the future of fossil fuel America, unless we decide collectively to choose another future. Joining me at the table tonight, my great pleasure to welcome Senator Bernie Sanders, independent from Vermont. May Booby, Executive Director and Co-Founder of 350.org, a grassroots climate change campaign, and Dan Dicker, veteran oil trader and president of Merck Block and CNBC contributor. And from Mayflower, Arkansas, we're joined by Glenn Hooks, Executive Director of the Sierra Club of Arkansas. No one from ExxonMobil or the American Petroleum Institute was available to join us tonight. Glenn, I will begin with you. How big a story is this there, and what, what are residents being told? Well, we're here in Mayflower, Arkansas. Thanks for covering this story. Uh, when you get off the freeway in Mayflower, Arkansas, you can really smell uh, the oil spill. And I've spent some time today walking through the neighborhoods, uh, the evacuated neighborhoods. There aren't a lot of neighbors around to tell their story, but their story is being told by their oil-soaked backyards, by their ripped-up streets, and just by the smell in the air that this uh, tar sands oil has really uh, taken a big chunk out of Mayflower, Arkansas. It's a pretty ugly sight. My producers and I were going through local news accounts of, of the spill, and it was so startling. No one knew, almost no one seemed to know, that they were atop this oil pipeline. No, they don't know that. And, and actually what Exxon has been telling folks, uh, the story seems to be that, that the, this is just regular old West Texas crude, when in fact it's really thick, tar sands-like uh, Canadian uh, oil that's coming from, uh, from Alberta, as you mentioned. Uh, this is a much bigger mess than just a simple crude spill. This is something that if it gets in the water is going to sink. We're talking about dredging. Uh, this is a big deal. But you're right. Not a lot of people knew that this pipeline existed and certainly didn't know that it was carrying this really dirty Canadian tar sands. Yeah, will you explain why it's harder to clean up this stuff than your normal crude? Yeah, well, you know, a lot of times when you have an oil spill, you can use skimmers and skim it off the water because the oil will float. This is not 
your typical crude oil. This is much heavier, it's much thicker, it's much dirtier, and therefore a lot more dangerous. So if it gets in the waterways, uh, it's going to sink, it's not going to float. And so you're talking about a potentially uh, disastrous dredging process uh, in an area that is right here in the natural state, not where you'd expect to find uh, Canadian tar sands oil. Um, this in, in uh, a few years ago, there was an oil spill in Kalamazoo, Michigan, uh, which was also this very right. heavy oil, and it was fascinating. Um, EPA staff that worked on this may have responded to oil spills over many, many years, had never encountered a spill of this type of material in this unprecedented volume under these kinds of conditions. Um, it, you, what you get a sense of is this is stuff that is different than what people are used to being able to clean up. Right. So tar sands oil is has the highest carbon content of any oil that we know of. And right now, the spill we're seeing in Arkansas is a devastating problem. And the real shocker about it, as you alluded to, is that this pipeline carries one-tenth of what the proposed Keystone XL pipeline would carry. And so imagine the photos we're seeing from Arkansas times 10, and that overlaid over the Ogallala Aquifer in Nebraska, our nation's largest source of fresh water. I'm going to push back because, I, not that I am in favor at all about for Keystone. Spill. No, it, you're on it, record. It, indeed, I'm pro oil spill. <laughs> Here's what the oil companies will say about this. They will say that Keystone I loved it is, is, is a brand oil. new pipeline and, in fact, is much less, less likely to rupture and spill oil sands than this 80-year-old pipeline. Now, we have dozens of pipelines running through this country, and unfortunately, the infrastructure on oil pipelines is the same as the infrastructure on bridges and roads and tunnels. That is, it's falling apart. Nobody ever builds a new one unless they need it, and they keep on fixing the old ones. So, in fact, not that I'm in favor of this. This is a horrible tragedy. We do have hundreds of spills, though, every year, and this is going to be one that they're going to say the Keystone Pipeline actually helps out on. As a, as a center for the Energy Committee and and, and, and someone who's, who's talked a lot about Keystone, when you see these images, Senator Sanders, what's your response? My response is, it reminds me of what happened on the Gulf Coast. It reminds me of the Exxon Valdez, which are even a hell of a lot worse than what we're seeing there in Arkansas. But I'll tell you what, Chris, it really raises the broader question, and that is whether we continue to be a carbon-based economy, whether we finally recognize that if we don't get a handle on greenhouse gas emissions, that this planet is going to be facing some disastrous problems in years to come. Uh, as a member of the Energy Committee and the Environmental Committee, we have talked to scientists. You know what these scientists tell us? They say, you know, the projections that we made about the damage for global warming, we were wrong. We underestimated the problem. What they're now saying is if we don't get our act together and start cutting in a very significant way greenhouse gas emissions, we're talking about this planet heating up by 8 degrees Fahrenheit by the end of the century. And that is calamitous for this planet. And you know what? Here's the thing. There are alternatives. And you never hear about a solar spill. When right. you hear about a solar spill, we call it a beautiful day. <laughs> well, but here's, but okay, but, but, but Keystone has become this kind of flashpoint for the environmental movement. And obviously, this being in the news is, is um, useful. It's a catalyzing moment, right? As we all think about building this massive new pipeline. There's already part of that pipeline's already built. Part of it's already being built. The last part, which crosses the border in the north, is the one that's awaiting for approval. And the idea here is that the reason that this is so important isn't just because you're going to get oil spills. So that's, that's part of it. And I want to talk about the risk from that. It's that this will push us over into some new territory. But, Dan, I mean, the, the argument that gets made by the State Department in their draft environmental impact study, the argument that gets made by a lot of people, is that that oil is coming out no matter what. And when you look at how much money there is to be made from it and the amount of capital investment that firms are willing to do to extract it, that seems like there's something to that argument. It is an economic equation. And, in fact, this bill proves to you, for example, that Keystone is just one pipeline. That, in fact, Canadian sands are coming down to this country. And even if the president were to disallow Keystone from being built, it would not stop Canadian oil sands from coming to this country. We already, if you talk to oil schedulers, they will tell you that they don't particularly need Keystone XL in order to move the amount of Canadian sands that they in fact want to move. It just makes things a whole heck of a lot easier if they get this extension. Remember, Keystone already exists. Right. The reason they call it XL is because it's made bigger, not because it's not there already. So one of the issues that you have to deal with is, I think this is an important Right. I mean, an important uh, point that you have to take on Keystone because it's a symbol and an important one. That's not shouldn't be lost. But what should be remembered are the, the, the truths about Canadian oil sands. They are coming into this country already. They will continue to come into this country whether or not Keystone is stopped. Well, I think very simply, here's what the truth is. 
The truth is that the President of the United States, the Congress, and the American people have got to say, this is it. Not only do we not want a Keystone XL pipeline, but we have got to fundamentally transform our energy system away from coal, away from oil, and into sustainable energy and energy efficiency. What we are fighting for, you know, people talk about e economics. We are fighting for the future of the planet. We are talking about more and more Sandys and Irenes, which cost huge amounts of money in terms of rebuilding those communities, not to mention the future disasters that we'll see. But, and yet, here, here strikes me as the problem. Um, on March 22nd, a, proceed, a, a, a symbolic vote in your august body, United States Senate, of which you are a proud member, um, 62 in favor, 37 against, a symbolic resolution calling for the approval of the Keystone Pipeline, including Democrats, quite a few, Baucus, Bages, Bennett, uh, Carper, Casey, Coons, Donnelly, and, I must note, Senator Pryor of the great state of, of Arkansas. And I don't know how the president walks away from considering that he appeared during the election period in front of all those pipes in Cushing. He said he was expediting the southern half. He said he was waiting for the, uh, the governor of Nebraska to approve uh, a rerouting. He was waiting for the State Department to give approval and, and give its environmental study. He's gotten both of those. I don't know how he says no to Keystone at this point, even though he probably should. I don't know how he says that, no. That's the question I want to ask. I want to ask after the break, how do you say no to Keystone? Play some sound for the Republicans. And Glenn, I want to hear your thoughts on your senator and how this might change his mind right after the break.